or to the production of the magistrate, or to the kind of evidence, what happens in police custody, what happens in judicial custody, what happens after that. And we, we're making a sort of national database very similar to the counted of the Guardian, which tracks extrajudicial killing. So investigation into what is, who is the terrorist, or what is the terrorist act, what kind of evidence has the state come up, what are the patterns of prosecution, also led us, along with Manisha, to found the Innocence Network in India, where we are working uh, for criminal justice reform at one level, where we are looking at specific laws, uh, sections which are unconstitutional, uh, trying to do advocacy, pushing the boundaries, trying to work around specific clauses, at the same time trying to do rehabilitation of those who have been wrongfully prosecuted. So, very quickly, um, I'm going to make two main points here. Number one, around the 9-11 as an epistem, and number two, the construction of the terrorist subject. Unlike many narratives which locate 2001 as an epistemic moment in the national security posturing of the state, we argue that such posturing was available well before that in pre-colonial, uh, in the colonial time as well, and also in independent India. Uh, we have a, in independent India, we have had a history of how the state has sought to criminalize uh, democratic assertions, uh, whether it's through TADA or whether it's through disturbed acts, and how political opponents have been kept in prisons and criminalized, um, and the state has sought to dealt with such movements through criminal law. And mark sections of populations, identities, ideologies, uh, have been sought to have, ex ex the state has sought to exercise coercive control over them through criminal law. Um, what did happen, however, in 2001, which is what we are arguing, is the Indian state's sync posturing synchronization with larger global trends. Um, of course, it was held by, by the form government that was there at that time. Um, however, this synchronization happened even when the certain certainties that were available in the global context were not available in the Indian context, vis-a-vis -vis narratives of Muslim militancy. So, what, what, what we are saying is that this, this, there's something forced about uh, propping up of a narrative of Muslim militancy uh, in India post-2001, and it is something in which the criminal justice system has, um, has played a very, very crucial role in it. There have been largely, if, if we have to see the, the trends post-1993 in terror prosecution, I would say the three main phases. One, the first being post-1993 cases where the state is saying that these kind of terrorist activities were happening as a response to communal violence. That's the seven years between 1993 and 2001. Al-Umma in the South, 1993 bomb blast, some incidents in Delhi uh, and in the North. In 2001, you see the coming of Porta and you see the guilt by association, uh, the, the prosecution around student Islamic movement, which was banned. And you see that for the next seven years, the cases uh, are largely around Sini, and the narrative of the state was such that uh, it is a home, it, it is it's a national uh, movement which is supported by Pakistani uh, organizations or uh, or funding or whatever it is. However, post 2008, you have the coming of the Indian Mujahideen in the scene, which is a very homegrown sort of network according to the state, completely independent of these forces. And then you have, in 2014, the coming in of ISIS, uh, which is also sort of a little uh, different from... Looking at legal cases, documents across this period, speaking to uh, those who have been convicted, uh, those who have been prosecuted, largely those who have been prosecuted have been acquitted of these cases, and... Um, it's, 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 it's one, it's very evident that the, the whole discourse of Muslim militancy uh, does not stand on fact, uh, but on prejudice. And uh, while saying that, we are not saying that there not, has not been incidents where sections of citizens, including Muslim 
uh, who have not participated in some sort of terrorist violence, but that the law of discourse is driven by prejudice and not facts. Within this, the construction of the, uh, how, how is the terrorist subject constructed as a category that is fundamentally different from the category of the citizen is something that we are essentially dealing with in this paper. Where the state's deployment of the charge of terrorism, and I don't mean just legal charge, or the very suspicion of it, puts the subjects through a battery of violence that denudes citizens of all rights or agency as citizens. Here it's very, uh, we argue that law is not the source of the exception, but rather a manifestation, one of the many manifestations of the exception, um, which largely lies in the realm of the political. And that the violence perpetrated on the subject of the terror accused exists both in the realm of the law and outside it, where all institutions, the police, judiciary, the media, as well as the larger citizenry at large, comes together in the perpetration. That the violence and terror prosecution is not limited even by the extraordinary diluted procedures of terror laws, but actually exists outside of it also. Here, I now we, 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 I'd like to just go into some of the pre-trial uh, aspects that highlight what I'm trying to say, and powers will cover the trial aspects and post-trial aspects by uh, Whipple. So, a very common pattern that you see in terror prosecution is that People are abducted in the middle of the night, at odd hours of the night, by plainclothes uh, policemen. And they are taken to the outskirts of the city, where they are kept in what is called illegal detention for a period, which on an average is between 2 to 15 days. Sometimes it can be 30, or even in case of found to be more than 2 months. The torture that happens here is, while they're I mean, we know, we are well aware that arbitrary detention, torture, extrajudicial killing is normal affair. What I'm trying to say is that there are some things that are very specific to terror prosecution that make the terror subjectivity very different. And here, in terms of torture, there is the element of a very communal religious torture, which is evident in Mecca Masjid Blast case or other cases where uh, drunk policemen have, have, have forced people to recite uh, verses from, I mean, Muslim, Muslims have been forced to recite verses of the Quran where they were then booted on the mouth. And there have been many such incidences and during, during testimonies when we meet them, these are very specific things that they most specifically remember, that the torture was very specifically around their identity as Muslims or their, their After that, in police custody, apart from elongated durations, we all know how terror laws have diluted larger procedures. Uh, the treatment meted out to uh, terror under trials display consistent patterns of third degree torture including humiliation in front of family members, frequent visitation from senior police officers with monetary offers for turning approvers is quite common. And this is on record on the case in the 7-Eleven Mumbai train blast case. These offers run concurrently with a frank acknowledgement of the innocence of the accused by the senior police officers. That we know that you are innocent, however, we are going to offer you this. The current going rate for turning approver in a highly political case is rupees 25 lakhs. In judicial custody, terror under trials are commonly kept in high security barracks that are reserved for a certain kind of convicted criminals. They are marked as ISI, and this is where the non-legal aspect also comes in. ISI in both the, in the registers, the judicial registers, as well as outside their barracks, and are segregated for specialized treatment. All their rights within prisons remain suspended, with terror under trials denied access to visitation, books, and all other rights, citing various security concerns. A frequent pattern in Maharashtra prisons is the violence meted out by criminal gangs who are out to prove their patriotism, especially the Chota Rajan gang which sorts to distinguish itself from the Dawood Ibrahim gang, and, has, and works in tandem with the prison officials in order to discipline them where there are issues of terror because some of the terror uh, under trials are quite educated and have sought to use provisions of the law for their own rights. They have used these gangs to discipline them through violent physical uh, means. Um, 
this, but in, in the pre-trial, in the police custody and judicial custody, these are some of the specific aspects. I would like now to invite Powers to cover some of the trials. Um, thank you, Sharif. Uh, so, talk about the trial aspects of terror prosecutions would probably take a very long time. So, I'll just be concentrating on a very small aspect of specific kinds of trials. And uh, since yesterday there's been some discussion here about the fact that terrorism has pushed the state or allowed the state to move towards a preventive idea of criminalization. And uh, it can also be argued, in fact, that inchoate crimes and the criminalization of activities that are not actual violent acts is a central feature of all anti-terror legislations. And our study of terror prosecutions in Maharashtra actually seems to highlight this point. Of the roughly 200 cases involving Muslim accused that we have studied in Maharashtra, 91 cases are of affiliation to banned organizations. In this case, the Student Islamic Organization uh, Movement. And then there is a huge chunk of conspiracy cases where no actual violence has taken place. And the cases where the charges relate to acts of violence are less than 20. And these are mostly the high-profile cases like the 7-Eleven train blast, the 26-11 attacks, Maregao, Khartkopar, etc. On the face of it, the logic of this kind of criminalization seems to be very sound. Since terrorist acts of violence cause large-scale devastation, it's certainly worthwhile that uh, uh, to prevent them and therefore organizations that propagate terrorist ideas must be banned and the so-called radicalization of youth must be prevented. However, when we look at how these cases actually play out, when we try to look behind the promulgation and operation of these preventive provisions, it becomes impossible not to question this logic and to ask whether this is the only motivation at play. I will be trying to look at the phenomena of guilt by association as a manifestation of this idea of preventive criminalization. Now, as we all know, Section 3 of the UAPA uh, contains provisions that allow the government to declare an association unlawful. And Section 10A lays down that anyone who continues to be a member of an organization that is declared unlawful can be sentenced to punishment up to two years. Of course, UAPA also has Section 10B, which says that if you are actually taking part in any unlawful activities, that uh, imprisonment can be from five minimum of five years up to ten years. So UAP actually recognizes a passive and an active membership, and it penalizes both kinds of membership. Now, on 27 September 2001, Simi was declared an unlawful organization. And in the week following September, uh, 27 September, there were a flurry of arrests across the country, including in Maharashtra. In Maharashtra, a total of 91 cases were filed under Section 10, Membership of Unlawful Organization. The bulk of these was from 2001 to 2003, in the space of two years. There were also a few cases in later years, and the last one was in Ako the district of Akola in 2009. These are all cases, all 91 cases, where no act of violence is being alleged merely membership of an organization that is declared unlawful. And in the last 15 years, only 42 of the 91 cases have been disposed, in which there are just three convictions and complete acquittals in 39 cases. In courts, to get a conviction, the prosecution has to prove continuing membership of an organization, even after it is declared unlawful. To do that, there are two or three different assertions that are repeated in FIR of almost all of these cases. The first is, one is that uh, the accused were, uh, was arrested from a public meeting of the organization, mostly while addressing the meeting. However, despite it being a public meeting, the only witnesses that are presented in court are policemen who have carried out the arrest. Another is that they were arrested from the local office of the organization while in an organizational meeting. And then there are cases where the accused is said to have been arrested from their home where incriminating materials were recovered. Now, these materials could be books, pamphlets, posters, CDs of videos on Gujarat riots or the Babri Masjid demolition and organizational documents like letters of correspondence, receipts, etc. The books could include, of course, uh, they will include um, anything published by Sini, but they often also include copies of the Quran, children's books in Urdu, books of Urdu poetry, and in one case there was even a copy of Outlook magazine in which the cover story was on Osama bin Laden. And in the charge sheet, uh, it mentioned that the accused was found in possession of a photograph of bin Laden. This kind of evidence, of course, does not lead to conviction, but it is often more than enough for the media to conduct its own trial at the time of arrest and for stigma and for the idea of dangerousness to get attached. The three convictions that happened were all on the basis of organizational documents, specifically letters of correspondence between them and other members of SIMI dated after the date of the ban. So that was something which showed they were continuing some activity. 
all the three convictions here were under section 10A and the accused were let off for time served. We must remember that these cases represent the least coercive elements of preventive criminalization by anti-terror legislation. And even here, the supposed logic of criminalization is so clearly subverted. The purpose of section 10 clearly seems to be to ensure that once an organization is banned, its members should not be able to carry out its activities. However, in this case, you can see that as soon as the ban happens, the police make a series of arrests that appear to have dealt a decisive blow to a terrorist organization. But as subsequent developments reveal, they are, they are merely a tool to penalize people who were known or thought to be members of an organization before it was banned. None of these people had any acts of violence attributed to them. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really make a difference that they weren't convicted or that their cases are still pending. Because the stigma of being part of a terrorist group, of carrying out its activities and of being a dangerous element gets attacked just by virtue of being arrested. Now my colleague Vipul will uh, elaborate further on this phenomena. I just want to end here with one question, which is whether this represents a state of exception designed only for terrorism or is this the manifestation of a larger impulse within the state to criminalize certain ideas. And uh, here we must also remember that UAPA was brought in in 1967, it contained unlawful uh, uh, association provision even then. And this was brought in shortly after the 16th Amendment, which brought in 1904, reasonable restriction on freedom of association. And both 1904 and UAPA were part of the recommendations of the National Integration Council, which was set up by Jawaharlal Nehru. So the idea of guilt by association is somewhere, has always been present in the state's idea of integration and uh, the imagination of integration. And 9-11 has nearly <coughs> militarized it and given it more teeth, so to speak. Uh, now I'll take a leave and I'll hand over to Vipul. <coughs> Thank you, Vipul. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, uh, Shadiv and Pavas. Uh, taking the discussion forward, uh, taking the discussion forward, I'll be talking about the post-trial phase of terror, terror, terror prosecution a brief look at uh, post-equitable scenarios of, uh, of innocence lay bare the extraordinary nature of prosecution where many of the elements asso asso associated with terrorism, the stigma, the social and economic exclusion, and as a con consequence, criminalization continue even after acquittal. One way of looking at post-trial phase would be looking at convictions and acquittals. Uh, I don't intend to get into a debate of acquittal and convic uh, conviction for the boundaries of acquittal conviction, guilt, innocence, lightness, darkness are not sufficient to understand the complex problem posed by criminal justice system. This paper attempts to argue of how this is one way system where once someone is prosecuted there is no way out even after the acquittal. The principle of innocent until proven guilty does not hold for prosecution in terror cases, rather the principle of the, uh, pr the principle in terror cases is you are assumed to be guilty from the beginning of the trial, and in fact one is considered as guilty even after being pro uh, proven innocent. Here, the role of media through its calculated presence and absence is crucial in the way it sustains the image of terrorists even after an accused has been declared innocent. The burden of guilt is not just on individuals who have been exonerated, but also on their families and the entire community who are labelled as terrorists or potential terrorists. Let us take example of Wasif Haider. Wasif was well-educated, he is not a poor person, he was a well-educated professional working as an engineer in a, in a multinational company, was framed in case of ban organization, in, in Sydney case. He was arrested in 2001, acquitted in 2009 after, after spending 8 years in jail. Wasif was unable to find any job after you know, coming out of jail, constantly harassed by the police who would call him for questioning at any time of the day or night or would land up to, uh, even to his door. Wasif's image as a terrorist, a terror, a terrorist continues even years after his acquittal. Local media in Kanpur kept, kept, uh, kept referring to him as a terrorist even a year after he was acquitted. The report said that police was closely monitoring the normal lives of terrorists who has been released from jail, their phone records and source of income. A similar report was uh, published two days later and in 2010, one fine day, Wasif decided to file a writ petition against this uh, media group. Uh, and his action did not help him much, the harassment increased on him. Uh, his, uh, his children, his daughters were also intimidated in this whole process where, he, where they, once his daughter was picked up by, uh, by some goons and said that you know you ask your father to mind his business otherwise he would uh, end up in jail again. With a uh, very little local support, uh, Wasif has had to, you know, uh, uh, has been left to fend for himself. Uh, he has to have, uh, he has to, he has to, you know, come, uh, continuously look at his family. He is not able to find job. 
his children also uh, face the burden of holding the uh, stigma of uh, uh, of terrorists because uh, no children play with them they are, uh, they, they, uh, his his daughters uh, are called atanki ki beti and uh, they have been dropped out of uh, education system because of uh, because, because he does not have job was basis case is not an exception but stigma social boycott and continuous uh, harassment by police and media is a trend that emerges in almost all the cases Wasif case is reference uh, is reflective of social re uh, reality that is seen in the post trial stage in almost every case where the person has been exonerated by law while conducting social audit of uh, of terror cases in maharashtra the ex exonerees in every case shared in their testimonials of how they uh, they have to report to police station on weekly or fortnightly basis this happens in almost all the cases a procedure which has no basis this this entire process procedure has no basis in law In many in many cases, this process continues for decades after the acquittal. While discussing about boycott, in, it is pertinent to underline another trend that in, uh, that emerges in our uh, social audit of how during interrogation, as many in in in, my, in, in our interviews, in as many as 20 to 25 cases, uh, the then ATS chief, Mr. Raghuvanshi, uh, he's he's he's. Uh, He was a very senior person in in the uh, uh, investigating agency. Uh, he's the chief of anti-terror squad, and I'm quoting uh, what he told these people. He gave the reason for why this is done to them. So, it, it, I'm quoting Mr. Uh, Mr. Raghuvanshi. We know that you are neither a terrorist nor capable of planting any bomb, but your religious ideas are a bomb in itself, and we are prosecuting you to ensure that you are socially boycotted. This ATS chief saying very directly. Unapologetically, uh, un uh, 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 unapologetically, I would like to underline the term social boycott. Social boy boy boycotting is not new to Indian social system. In instruments of social boycott and demonization of communities has been used atrociously against Dalits in India India's historical past. In the present social political context, Muslims are the new targets. And what's very saddening is that this is being instrumented by very active part participation of various components of criminal justice system. This paper argues further about. Uh, social boycotts. It argues that social boycotts are not just against any crime or criminal alone, but through a system of graded social boycotting, a new hierarchy is being laid down. In this graded system of social boycott, the exonerated individual and his families are at the bottommost level, who face the maximum brunt of social ostracization. During the investigating process, all the close relatives and friends are identified and they are systematically intimidated and targeted, which distances themselves from immediate victims. And also leads to them being socially boycotted. The next layer, the neighboring community, who knows about their innocence, are forced forced to distance themselves because of fear of being uh, prosecuted or persecuted for guilt by uh, association. On the other hand, a permanent label of terrorists through media reports ensure that the non-Muslims are compelled to see the entire Muslim community as terror suspects. Global narratives of terrorism, Islam, and war on terror has ensured that individual label of terrorist is now linked. to people following islamic faith across the globe people like us who are not muslims who are working on this issue whether as an activist lawyer or researcher are at the outermost rung of this systemic social boycott structure who are looked upon as anti nationals and colluding with terrorists by our own community family and friends this explains very briefly about criminalization stigmatization demonization and otherization is done by active participation of various social political institutions in general and by criminal justice system in particular okay i'll just conclude uh, coming back to uh, yesterday's discussion on criminal law and dangerousness i would like to argue that perception of dangerousness can be understood differently based on viewpoint of those who perceive danger for instance anything which threatens the status quo can be perceived as dangerous for the status quoist and similarly if one critically questions the status quo they will perceive the existing status quo as the most dangerous thing from where we see the prosecution case the most dangerous phenomena is the organized crime perpetrated by the law enforcement agency uh, for us spoke about semi cases and affidavits one commonality in many of these affidavit is that case of prosecution is always based on an informer now this informer is a subject which is very less studied in our criminal justice uh, uh, subject uh uh it's pertinent to ask who these informers are police on the basis of mere suspicion implicates an individual in a fabricated case in a uh, and in a fabricated case and after a routine process of extra legal torture and intimidation the person in his most vulnerable condition is given an option of plea bargain where his charges and quantum of punishment can be negotiated if he agrees to terms and conditions set by the police this plea bargaining is not part of legal process and used as a tactic to 
Shaitan and uh, Shaitan the accuse, the person in such vulnerable state is not left with any real choice but to agree to the informer of the police. Since there is no way out, the informer may agree to do anything, literally anything that the investigating agency asks them to do. If the informer refuses to follow any of the direction given the, by the police, he can be falsely implicated in multiple cases. One such case is that of Rishad Ali, who was framed in terror case, and we can say he was framed because during uh, because uh, during this trial, a CBI report exonerated him, saying that he was a police informer against whom a case was fabricated by officer handling it. Even after the CBI uh, report came out, it took seven years for the court to finally acquit him. What was his crime? Very important question: What was crime of this person? His crime was he said no to police. In his testimony, Ishad has alleged that police wanted him to incite young Muslim men to go for jihadi training to Pakistan. So it's not some jihadi organization sending people outside. He has a case there which can, you know, give a very different perspective of understanding of dangerousness. What is dangerous? Thus, to conclude, the agencies which are entrusted with the duty of enforcing law and order by virtue of their unquestioned power can systematically create and run an alternative criminal system with utmost impunity. It is also pertinent to note that the judicial system acquits the accused in terror cases on grounds of procedural lapses in investigation uh, conducted by the police, but has failed to hold the police accountable for malicious prosecution. The impunity is resulting from nexus of judiciary and investigating agency, filled by the myth of national security, strengthens the dominant discourse on terrorism. Since I don't have much time, just one ending note. What is a criminal justice system if justice is eliminated from the system, it is, it is left with criminal system. I would end with this. Uh, so we move on now to Manisha, Manisha Sethi, who's uh, talking about tenuous legality, the tensions of the terrorism law in India. Well, I think the title is more ambitious than my paper. <laughs> And it's a very kind of a sketchy outline of a larger project, which is, um, I did an ethnography of uh, the Simi tribunal in 2014. I followed it across the country where the tribunal was sitting. And <coughs> these are just some kind of introductory uh, ideas about thinking about that tribunal. And uh, uh, like my uh, friends before me, uh, I'm going to focus on, therefore, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. Uh, which is the current anti-terror legislation and as uh, we are all aware that it was preceded by TADA earlier and then uh, POTA which uh, and both TADA was lapsed in uh, 1995 after large scale outcry that it was a mechanism of uh, persecution and the latter was also repealed in 2004 after the UK government came into power one of the its, uh, pr promises being that it would scrap the law in response to similar complaints against it. So while scrapping quota, there was a simultaneous fortification of UAPA, many of its provisions absorbed kind of wholesale through amendments into UAPA 1967. So UAPA is a law which exists prior to uh, both Tata and quota, which was promulgated in 1967. So I was mentioned about the National Integration Council, but uh, that's right, and we also must remember that 19, uh, UAPA was brought into uh, the parliament twice before it was passed, I mean twice it was uh, withdrawn because there wasn't uh, there was a great deal of opposition to it in 1967 it was passed and remember that it was in the aftermath of uh, you had the china war you had the pakistan war and uh, you had a kind of internal emergency already in place one talks about emergency you know in the emergency but remember that we already had a period of emergency where the defense of india rules were fortified and uh, you know the whole idea of unlawful association ship was uh, already in, in 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 circulation at that time now both TADA and POTA have received challenges in the Supreme Court um, and however the allegations of these laws suffered from the vice of unconstitutionality in terms of the provisions which attack the fundamental right to fair trial by subverting established evidentiary rules and allowing the admission of confessions, secret witnesses, long detention, etc. were rebuffed in the voice of constitutionality. The Qatar Singh judgment, for example, upheld the constitutionality of TADA while the Supreme Court decided that of POTA in the PUCL versus Union of India case. In Qatar, in the Supreme Court affirmed the constitutional wholesomeness of the Act by introducing some safeguards in the recording of confessions and by recommending a quarterly review of cases. The adoption of these safeguards as statutory provisions in POTA was hailed as a great advance and testimony to the will of the legislature to ensure a check on the abuse of executive power. However, the gap between the promise of rights and the legal erosion of these rights through these laws was too great to be filled. So, uh, what basically I try and do is to examine this uh, you know, gap 
uh, or lag between the formalistic legality of UAPA and its actual effects, which can be patently unlawful or even illegal. And I'm going to look at, as I said, UAPA was amended and provisions of quota were brought in. But I'm not focusing on the terrorist uh, section of UAPA, but only looking at the unlawful association section, which is section 3. Uh, so UAPA, it basically says that an organization can be banned by declaring it as an unlawful association under section 3.1 of the UAPA 1967. And action under this can be taken by the central government for activities or objectives which are secessionist or which are punishable under section 153, that's promoting enmity between different groups, or 153B imputation assertions prejudicial to national integration of the Indian Penal Code. So, the act, the UAP itself, uh, you know, claims for its, uh, itself objectivity and due process, unlike TADA and POTA where you had, you know, admission of confessions and so on, or unlike the CLA 1908, uh, which by executive fiat could declare associations as unlawful. So here UAP says that it is an, unlo it is an objective law filled with due process uh, because the status of a judicial, and it says that there is, a, you know, judicial determination which happens alongside uh, the, the banning which distinguishes it not only from preventive detention laws, but in fact places it at a plane superior to it. A distinction is drawn by the Supreme Court in the jamaat e Islami case, as you're aware, in 1992, after the demolition of the Babri Masjid, the RSS was banned under this. But simultaneously, for some strange reason, jamaat e Islami was also banned alongside. And uh, the RSS, the ban on the RSS was lifted almost immediately uh, by the tribunal, whereas uh, the tribunal which adjudicated mm -hmm. on the ban on jamaat e Islami upheld the ban. Now, uh, uh, so uh, in, in, in the Jamaat Islami case, it's interesting that the uh, counsel for the government said that UAP is a pre preventive detention law, that it is not a judicial determination of uh, causes uh, of, for banning, it, it is simply a preventive detention law. Now, however, earlier in the VG Ra case, as we know, there is a distinction that is made between pre preventive detention or externment which rests on suspicion and is perforce anticipatory, and on the other hand, the declaration of an association is unlawful, which could only be grounded in facts capable of objective determination by the court. This is what uh, Vijay Rao lays out. Now, so UAPA claims for itself this kind of status, saying that we are going to judicially determine whether there are grounds uh, to uh, ban an organization, and the provision of the serving of notice, specifying the grounds, disclosure of the facts on which they are based, the adjudication of the existence of a sufficient cause by the organization so declared unlawful, hold out the promise of procedural fairness, as well as a guarantee that restrictions imposed under UAPA would be reasonable. Uh, in the Jamaat Islami case, for example, the Apex Court warned that the tribunal is not required to be a mere rubber stamp or give an imprimatur or the opinion already formed by the central government. So uh, what I propose to do in the next 15-20 minutes is to look at really the, uh, the way in which the tribunals work. Uh, we've already seen how it works uh, in, you know, in, in terms of on ground, in terms of the trial, pre-trial and post-trial. So I'm going to just focus on the tribunal aspect and looking at um, the tribunal in the Simi case. Uh, though there are about, I think, about 10 or 11 organizations which are banned uh, under UAP as, un as unlawful associations, but there are very few organizations which actually contest the ban. And Simi is one of the organizations which has consistently uh, uh, contested the ban. Now the first question, and I'm going to focus on maybe two or three points for because uh, there's not much time. The first question that I'd like to focus on is, is the question of locus. Now one of the touchstones of procedural fairness of banning an organization under UAP is said to be the opportunity given to the banned organization to demonstrate its lawfulness and challenge its proscription under section 4. But how does an organization which is outlawed and criminalized represent itself before the might of law. Under the circumstances that an organization remains proscribed almost continuously, as has been Simi, the very act of challenging the ban, as its former office bearers have, uh, have, turns into proof of the continuance of the unlawful organization. And you know, every time there's a, this kind of a cat and mouse game before the tribunal that, oh, can uh, the lawyer representing Simi actually challenge, contest the ban or not? Uh, you know, it's always the question of locus is always uh, uh, you know, uh, contested, and this time in 2014, when the locus was actually granted, even though the ban was upheld, the lawyer for Simi said, "Oh, it's a great strike forward because we've been granted locus after you know <laughs> 10 or 12 years of contesting the ban." So, for example, in 2006, six, uh, the tribunal noted 
uh, that Sri Shahid Badr Falahi, uh, Falahi was uh, contesting the ban on behalf of Simi. Uh, in his cross-examination stated that he took upon himself to contest the present ban in spite of having ceased to be its All India President as the show cause notice issued by this tribunal was served on him. Of course, the notice was served on him at his address, but it was not in his individual capacity. It was a notice issued to the Respondent Association, which was to be got served through its office bearers, including Sri Shahid Badar Falahi, who happened to be its All India President at the time of its first ban in 2001. If Sri Badar Falai had ceased to be the member of the Respondent Association by virtue of having crossed the age limit of 30 years, it was not obligatory on his part to appear to contest the present ban on behalf of the Respondent Association. Not only that, he decided to contest the present ban against the Association in his individual capacity, he is also found to have been at pains to issue a press release on behalf of it. And it talks about, you know, in what capacity did he take upon himself to issue a press release and so on. Now, uh, I mean, it's a long quote, I won't go into all of it, but it concludes, the tribunal concludes, say, uh, say that one really wonders if Sri Shahid Badar Falai has ceased to have any connection with the Respondent Association by virtue of his ceasing to be a member or office bearer thereof. Why is he taking so much interest in defending the Respondent Organization? From the statement of uh, Sri Falahi in the course of his cross-examination, it does appear that he continues to hold the reins of the Respondent Organization in spite of having crossed the age limit for its membership. So now, though the 2006 tribunal did not deprive Falahi of his locus to challenge the ban, it did underline the vulnerability of those challenging the ban, exposing themselves to the possibility of being prosecuted for continuing the activities of an unlawful organization under Section 10A. Now, on the contrary, Falahi's contention uh, in the uh, tribunal that Simi had ceased to exist after the ban led to the state objecting to his very participation in the tribunal in 2008 on grounds that he was neither the office bearer uh, of the association nor its member in view of the statement that he's made before the uh, tribunal. It urged, therefore, that uh, Mr. Raja, that uh, uh, you know, the lawyer, uh, Jawar, has no local stand to contest the prohibition or to cross-examine the witnesses. Uh, so though this tribunal magnanimously uh, sort of permitted Falahi to participate in the proceedings in the interest of justice, the 2012 tribunal concurred with the uh, uh, ASG, uh, the State's Council, that individuals who may have had an association with the banned organization earlier and have since ceased to be associated or claim to have detached themselves from the association cannot be permit permitted to be re represented in these proceedings. Now, uh, so this renders the association in many ways unrepresentable. The unrepresentability of the banned organization is reiterated in many, many ways. For example, notices of banning were served on the organization as recorded in orders of the successive tribunals at its head office in Zakir Nagar in Delhi. One may note here that the head office was raided and sealed before these notices were served. So it's kind of a charade playing out. You've already sealed and banned, you know, closed the office and yet, uh, you know, the notices are being served there. Now, in contrast with the reluctance of the state to allow erstwhile members of the organization to challenge the ban in the tribunal, Notices have been served to several people at their addresses to appear before the tribunal if they wish to challenge the ban. Indeed, the 2014 tribunal noted that it has received a number of representations claiming that notices issued to them should not have been issued as they were neither members of SIMI nor were they involved in any of their activities and that no case had been registered against them. So, you know, on the one hand, not allowing the, uh, the members to uh, uh, challenge the ban and on the other hand, uh, you know, serving notices onto others. Now the second point that uh, I uh, wish to uh, uh, you know talk about a little bit is the grounds for notification because the whole idea is that you know it is all very it's not arbitrary executive fiat it's uh, all very there are first facts and then on the basis of those facts are the grounds and on the basis of the ground the notification is served and the organisation is asked to show cause. Now the bulk of the grounds for notification through the years have been very vague accusations such as. And I quote, Sydney members have been conducting meetings and giving inflammatory speeches. This is the 2006 notification. In 2012, for example, the notification says they have been radicalizing, brainwashing the minds and indoctrination of Muslim youth by jihadi propaganda and through provocative takreers, that is lectures or speeches, mm -hmm. through CDs, etc. Now in 2014, it says that they have been uh, holding meetings, including secret meetings, making secret meetings or making strategies to induct new members, discussing and raising funds, liaising with like-minded organizations like Popular Front of India and Ms. Uh, Popular Front of India is not banned as of now. Now, these allegations lack the tangibility that could invite a rebuttal on facts, the sacred benchmark of the act's reasonableness. Insofar as actual criminal cases are concerned, 
the basis for alleging these to be crimes of semiotic confessions under 161 CRPC, otherwise meaningless in a criminal trial, where accused confess to the police their continuing membership of SIMI. Now, the admittance, admittance, admittance of, sorry, of confessions as evidence of SIMI's existence now bears a clandestine and under, underground organization, including uh, and, and indulging in acts of terror, has been challenged consistently in every tribunal as has been the slipping in of sealed and secret material presented in almost every sitting of the tribunal as conclusive proof of the robust pace of the anti-national activities of the organization. And this I noticed, you know, in the tribunal, every single sitting of the tribunal, uh, there would be, uh, you know, a home ministry guy coming in with huge sealed packets, slipping them uh, to the, you know, uh, judge who was overseeing the tribunal. And of course, the counsel for the organization had no access to the secret sealed material. <coughs> Uh, so it's been challenged every time, uh, uh, you know. Uh, but these challenges now bear the, ca oh, sure. but these challenges now bear the character and feel of a ritualized drama whose conclusion is predetermined and scripted. The tribunal, tribunal, admittedly, is not a criminal trial, but a civil one, where the rules of evidence are to be followed as far as practicable, rendering the Indian Evidence Act inapplicable, strict or censor. Uh, from the first tribunal onwards, it has been the cardinal principle that since the tribunal is not a criminal trial against the accused person, but merely a civil adjudication to whether determine whether the organization was unlawful in its objectives and activities, the use of confessions would be not be hit by section 25 of the Indian Evidence Act, which prohibits custodial confessions from entering evidence. Uh, so Jamaat Islami took out of an exception within the due process, which it had glowingly upheld by cautioning that requirements of national justice should be tempered when the public interest so requires. It does stamp its approval on withholding sensitive information from the association and its members challenging the ban. You know, the point that Professor Bakshi was making yesterday about whether states are beleaguered or strong, I think it's a simultaneous invocation of both strength and weakness. You know, that, oh, we are beleaguered, we are besieged, and so we, therefore we need to be, you know, have these kind of strong measures to come to that. So that, that comes across very clearly, especially in the whole, you know, secret uh, material that's being uh, So, in, um, I'll just kind of keep on that. Now, in 2014, upholding the ban yet again, the tribunal conceded that there may be defects, incoherency, contradictions, and procedural ir irregularities during the recording of these statements, that is, confessions, which may prove fatal during the trial when placed under the scandal of Indian Evidence Act. But the confessions cannot be ignored for the purpose of determining the sufficiency of cause. So what is inapplicable in a criminal trial is allowed to enter into this to determine, uh, you know, the sufficiency of cause of banning the organization. Now, uh, very lastly, I have to say that what interests me here is not simply the bending of evidentiary rules in the tribunal as much as the effects that such a long-term ban and criminalization of an organization like SIMI may have on the criminal trials itself. And I could go on and on and on about these cases, uh, you know, but just to give one or two examples maybe. Uh, so what happens is that there is a kind of symbiosis between the ban and the registering of cases. Uh, and uh, I'm going to just quote one. I'll finish <laughs> And, uh, you know, in, in one of the cases, for example, from Madhya Pradesh in Pitampur, where uh, some, uh, you know, about 10 or 12 arrests were made by the, uh, you know, the local police uh, and was to this big busting of the semi module there. Now, immediately after these arrests were made, uh, the senior superintendent of police of Dhar shot of letters to various districts in Madhya Pradesh asking for registration of similar cases across the, uh, these districts. Now, these letters immediately set, set up a chain reaction resulting in 18 cases within one month and another four over the next six months. This surely must have been a kind of a sort of record of sorts. How can we be sure that the, it was the SSP's letters that produced this result? Not only do some of these cases so registered make an explicit reference to this letter, for example, you know, there are various FIRs that one can refer to, but the investigating officer of the case, BPS Parihar, himself produced 18 of these letters in the semi UAP tribunal in 2010. So you have this on the one hand, the continuation of the ban, Based on these continuing registration of FIRs and the you know and the cases being decided, then uh, you know Pawar spoke about acquittals, but you know in many places outside the you know uh, you know glare of media and civil society activists, you actually get a high rate of conviction in these cases. For example, in this Pitampur case, where recoveries had been shown from one person and the recoveries were challenged by uh, the accused, the uh, the and I'm quoting the court, uh, he, the court says that nothing documentary has been placed before it to prove their guilt. However, this does not have an adverse impact because it is not usually possible to find such proof. One cannot, in fact, expect or desire formal proof. This is the Sessions Court uh, convicting somebody under UAPA. So, I mean, the desire of proof has already uh, been thrown out of the window as well. 
And just to give one last example of the way in which UAB works is that when the notification or the grounds of notification are produced, you have you know uh, this whole uh, thing about how the band organization is continuing its activities, and it always the notification always gives this long list of overground organizations which are acting as front for SIMI. So you have all kinds of organizations, including many non-existent ones, because we try and try to trace many of these organizations. They were they did not exist at all. But it was sufficient that they had Muslim sounding names. Uh, but also many organizations which are perfectly legal, the Khairi Umar Trust, which is a charitable trust, Popular Front of India, which is not as of now banned, but which could be banned any day, uh, the Minority Rights Watch, for example. So you create this whole jurisdiction of suspicion and dangerousness, and anybody who gets attached to that, you know, kind of is enfolded into that, uh, you know, regime of suspicion. Uh, so I would just end up by saying that though it pretends to be uh, you know, uh, to be imbued with procedural fairness and uh, not like a preventive detention uh, act, UAP actually uh, ends up being, you know, li like a preventive detention act. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and now we move on to Professor Krishna Rao, who's been talking on state law and torture. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm off my news. And uh, one of the uh, first uh, uh, presentations you mentioned about it's not criminal justice system which is existing, it's only a criminal system. Professor B.B. Pandey always used to say in the criminal procedure and the lectures that please remember this is not a criminal system, this is a criminal justice system. Similarly, Professor Baxi always used to remind us when we speak about justice, we should also speak about injustice. That's the reason I thought, let me look at the state law and touch of what is a criminal injustice system. This is memorably pointed out by Dostoevsky in Crime and Punishment. How much youth was interred here between these walls for no purpose? What great forces? had perished in here to no avail. The most talents, the greatest strength, perished here unnaturally, unlawfully, irrevocably. Who is to be blamed for this? This is what is this criminal injustice system where we have heard about from the two presentations. One of the study of these 200 cases in Maharashtra under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, particularly the RS detention and trials, of the uh, Muslims which are uh, 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 suspe suspected to be involved in the terrorist activities and also we have heard the presentation of Manisha on the functioning of these tribunals. Let me take the, I wanted in three parts to present some of my views which I have been working for more than two decades into this agonizing domain of custodial violence in India and also have represented some of these cases as part of uh, when I was working with the Andhra Pradesh Civil Liberties Committee in India with Bal Gopal. So I wanted three uh, parts. First is looking at the context. What is the context of understanding the state law and torture in India? Then the second is, uh, I think this is again a session where uh, the second point I wanted to look at, the combination of critical criminology with the activist criminology. There we have seen how the activists and those who are engaged in the research, uh, these are the two. And then I move to the third is, what is a theory? How do we understand state law and the torture and in such of the theory? So this is what I am trying to look at through these uh, PowerPoints. First to look at the agonizing domain of custodial violence and the state crime and the activist criminology understanding and analyzing state lawlessness. I'll briefly focus on custodial violence and extrajudicial executions. And the state lawlessness in such a theory, four uh, interesting uh, articles. One is uh, Professor B.B. Pandey in his, uh, he says about lawmen's ways and policemen's ways. That's a confrontation between crime control model and due process model. And uh, this another one uh, is a uh, Lok, uh, uh, Lok Neet article, uh, this her book on transnational torture 
in uh, 2012 and uh, yeah Loknita Loknita and then look at uh, interesting study in 1993 Herbert Kerman on the social process facilitating torture so these are the some of the things I thought I just here again I wanted to borrow these ideas from another great uh, Chilean American writer Marguerite Adosian uh, says about how do we understand the torture we have to unmask to unmask the strategies of torture one must visualize two images the suffering open body exposed to the pain caused by the torturer and the intimacy of act of torture this is what is important when we look at the suffering open body remains invisible due to lack of public scrutiny in fact the reality is what happens in this custodial institution is not open to public scrutiny that makes uh, these invisible some of these crimes and this is structure is discreetly hidden away from the public view and this results in the denial and dignity and destruction of the personality of the detainees whether it is uh, the police station whether the prison whether several joint interrogation centers in several parts of india which are not uh, uh, open to public scrutiny which really makes and uh, the trauma in fact arrest is a frightening experience in fact and arrest of a petty theft you imagine arrest of a terrorist or suspected terrorist arrest of a left-wing extremist is a much more harrowing experience so this a detainee undergoes a trauma and from the beginning of the arrest detention in the same the police station or any other custodial institutions and some of the studies have pointed out that these phobic reactions when a person enters into the police station undergoes a several phobic reactions and sometimes unable to withstand that pressure may also result in easy death and in that process of when a person detainees and there several phobic reactions and a trauma which a person detainee undergoes in the police stations or other custodial center there is no food there is no deprivation of sleep and then uh, and in that process if a torture or infliction of a physical or mental pain is uh, uh, given and that will result in the easy death so i wanted you to understand the custodial trauma before you understand the state law and torture framework this accused and uh, there several interesting stories are circulated particularly in the whether in the custodial deaths or encountered deaths that accuse a suspect is uh, dead in mysterious circumstances and the state circulates suicide and natural death i somebody uh, said if somebody wants to uh, commit a suicide why they have to select police station as if there is no safer place outside the police station so these are all these uh, stories which are circulated and uh, this invisibility results in a lack of public scrutiny also the tortured body becomes a silent voice and mute in suffering and pain and if the victim survives then he can or she can speak and the, the witness in this process if the victim dies there is no one to speak for the dead and protect the living that's the reality of the custodial uh, trauma or a torture which is an invisible crime in India second part i do not want to go into much detail second part uh, is an interesting uh, two or uh, several articles i'll begin with in the academic circles in the international level the first time the use of the word state crime in fact state organized crime with william chambliss used in the american uh, society of criminology presidential address in 1989 he spoke about state organized crime later on it is revised as a state crime and uh, then later on uh, this has created an interest in the academic circles all over the world in the united states and uk to look into and examine the state crime state crime entered into the academic research after chambliss uh, uh, this uh, uh, presidential address Chambliss defined state crime as acts defined as criminal and committed by state officials in the pursuit of their job as representative of the state. 
Interesting, in 2015, this Bell Nap, in again in the American Society of Criminology Presidential Address in 2015, defines activist criminologist as one of the, uh, the what is the definition given by Bell Nap is one of the criminologists engaging in social and or legal justice at individual, organizational and or policy levels which goes beyond typical research, teaching and service. So this is what I wanted to look at in this domain of organizing uh, custodial violence. What we require is a critical criminology theory and activist criminology combining together to work for the law policy reform. Yes. Before Chambliss, yes. Yes. <laughs> Before Chambliss, I'll come to the national, the Indian, uh, in the Indian context, uh, this, uh, the 1969, 1970 onwards, the state crime issues of state crime human rights groups started, even Professor before Professor Upendra Bhaksi, state lawlessness in India. State lawlessness in India, this 1970s onward, this is Andhra Pradesh Civil Liberties Committee in Andhra Pradesh, Association of Protection of Democratic Rights from West Bengal, Committee for Protection of Democratic Rights from Maharashtra, and People's Union for Democratic Rights in uh, Delhi, and People's Union for Civil Liberties. In fact, if you look at, these are the three particularly Andhra Pradesh Civil Liberties Committee, Association for Protection of Democratic Rights and Committee for uh, Protection of Democratic Rights have been documenting since 1970 into all the custodial and extrajudicial executions in India. In that process, they were also targets of the state repression. And uh, so this is the, the initial activist or human rights activist documentation about state lawlessness in India started way before William Chambliss. But William Chambliss, I said about the international level, that spotlight on state crime that has, and uh, of course, Professor Bakshi in the crisis of the Indian legal system, two chapters on police and the prisons have uh, explained some of these uh, dilemmas and the crisis which is existing in India. And the human rights groups in India played a major role in critical activist criminologies and put a spotlight on state lawlessness. And Professor Muhammad Gauss uh, in 1985, he wrote in India on state lawlessness and lock of deaths. And that also is a pioneering work which has resulted in some other works. Now let's look at, yeah, briefly, uh, the, with the Protection of Human Rights Act in 1993, the Government of India has set up the National Human Rights Commission. One of the advantage of the National Human Rights Commission is, after 1993, at least there is some reliable official statistics are available to study the human rights violations committed by state, and they call as a custodial violence. So the National Human Rights Commission of India defines or classifies custodial violence into illegal detention and arrest, torture, custodial death and disappearance, and the custodial deaths are further classified into deaths in judicial custody, deaths in, deaths in prison, and deaths in police custody. Judicial custody is deaths in prison, and deaths in police custody is the police custody deaths. And extrajudicial executions, which are colloquially called as encounter deaths, have been added into human rights uh, violations of NHRC's uh, the data in 1997. In 2003, they have added another category, the deaths in defense and paramilitary custody. So this is some classification of state lawlessness or custodial violence under the National Human Rights Commission. And every year annual report will give about some of these. And the last uh, uh, more than 93 to 2014 mentions about increasing deaths in the prison. I will not go into the details. Now, I wanted to look at and uh, share, uh, discuss with you the how we construct a theory to understand the state lawlessness. This is what the first one is, uh, Lawman's, 
lawman's ways and policeman's ways. This is what in the students of criminal justice, criminal procedure, we start with this discussion. Crime control model, Herbert Packer, who has given us this crime control and due process model, and we start with the teaching of the criminal procedure with this. Professor Pandey says, the lawman's ways is the due process model. The constitution says, procedure says, policeman's ways is this uh, the crime control model. There is a constant conflict between crime control models. As Professor Pandey says, the human rights rhetoric hardly been able to transform the concrete reality due to this conflict between lawman's ways and policeman's ways. It's very interesting if you look at particularly the D.K. Basu, Joginder Kumar and Sheila Varsi. 1983 to the D.K. Basu is a landmark in the custodial violence in the, uh, the custodial ju justice, but entire discretion is available only to the police. So whether your Article 32, Article 226 and such warrant under the Criminal Procedure Code is a completely meaningless unless the policeman decides to enter arrest into the station house day. So how do we do that? Interesting article, this John Hopkins University, Thomas Simon in 2015, he says, so far torture debate is, troubling thing in the torture debate is, they have focused all these years on the victim. We should shift the focus from victim to the perpetrator. Very interesting. What it matters is a state as a perpetrator which implements and it is a policy. Second interesting is Lok Nitha book on transnational torture 2011 argues, this is a very interesting argument, I think some of these issues have come in this uh, panel. Torture is a manifestation of loss, tension with violence and it is continually accommodated and negotiated within the law itself as exemplified by the jurisprudence of interrogation in both India and United States. We have seen how these torture happens, whether from the arrest, detention, and during interrogation, and even the post-interrogation, what we have seen. So this violence is produced and legitimized by procedure, policies, and practices. That's the reason I would prefer to call as a criminal injustice system. And uh, the denial of torture and lack of public debate, this is again Loknita says, the denial of torture and lack of public debate on it relegates it down to the problem of policing only at the lower levels. This is an interesting study of Herbert Kerman in 1993 who identifies three uh, uh, processes, the social processes facilitating torture. He says the three key concepts, authorization, routinization and dehumanization. If you say that Bhagalpur these are the professional thieves. Or so and so is a suspected dangerous terrorist, Islamic militant. Then you say you justify, authorize that though you have a separate preventive detention, you have unlawful activities prevention, they can be tortured, confession is granted, so you are authorizing by the procedure and other. Once it is authorized, it has become a routinization. You have created some of these special task forces and special police those who are bloodthirsty policemen. And then once it becomes that process, this is dehumanize as a person. In fact, one of the police officers recently in the Orissa in the discussion, he was saying, there's a completely change. When daughter has pointed out, when he was a young police officer, he was like this. But in that <coughs> process, after five years, when due to the daughter's influence, daughter started interrogating him and then there's a complete change in his attitude and perception and he's a completely different man he mentioned about in a, one of the time. So the justification of torture as a means of protecting the state against as threats to its security helps to authorize the practice. The development of a profession of torturers as part of state's security apparatus helps to routinize the administration of torture and the designation of torture, targets of torture as enemies of the state are excluded from the state protection and helps to dehumanize. Lastly, I'll end with this. I was just sharing yesterday about this uh, German uh, uh, jurist, Gunther Jacobs, in that book on insecurity states, uh, Peter Ramsey, 2012. He mentions about this uh, Gunther Jacobs, who proposed that much of the contemporary criminal law can be characterized as enemy criminal law. 
illegal form that contrasts with citizen criminal law. In the enemy criminal law, the punishment precedes harm, resulting in suppression of procedural rights. The reverse is citizen's criminal law. It separates dangerous from law-abiding and advocates punishment proportionate to crime. Thank you. And then finally, um, we have uh, Henry T. Tarvalu on terrorism, prevention, recognition, and criminal law. Thank you. Uh, let's say this is a really good panel. It's a tough fact to follow. So I think I'll, uh, I'll do my best to try and, and uh, uh, maintain because my my take this is based on a paper that i wrote years ago and uh only recently i revisited it a bit and it's a uh a, a quite a theoretical paper most of it is about hegel but what i'll do is i'll i'll, sp I'll spare you from talking about hegel you have to know that dead white man too much and i'll i'll try and <laughs> i'll try and put it in do you like hegel ah good <laughs> so i'll try and, and put well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Hegel, but I'll try to put that more in context uh, with the discussion. Right? So I'd like to start actually from where uh, uh, the last presentation finished. So there is this interesting uh, argument by Gunther Jakob, this idea that you can see two types of criminal law, enemy and citizen criminal law, and uh, uh, contemporary criminal law looks much more, mostly acts like enemy criminal law. And I'd like to start by by saying I don't like this distinction. Uh, I think it's very problematic for two reasons. First, I, in my head, there is no citizen criminal law. This doesn't really exist. Uh, this is an ideal in the mind of, of most many, many, many jurists. But uh, the subject of criminal law is never a citizen or never treated as a citizen. It's mostly, at best, if we want to use that really the favorite place of, of criminal law uh, scholars, but the, the, which actually represents a tiny part of the criminal justice process, which is the trial. So if we really idealize that moment of the trial, even there, the subject of criminal law is at best a conditional citizen. Uh, but So citizen criminal law is an ideal, very nice ideal, but doesn't really exist. And therefore, enemy criminal law is an oxymoron, right? Uh, criminal law, the criminal part already uh, Con denotes hostility. Right? So in this paper I recently co-authored with a colleague from sociology department at Warwick with, called Why Punishment Pleases, part of our main argument is that this intrinsic, there is this intrinsic aspect in punishment that tries to generate an abstract idea of solidarity and community through <coughs> hostility. So it, it, it wants to bring us together uh, by putting us against others. Right? So criminal law is always enemy criminal law in my, in my uh, at least potentially. Right? At the very best, the criminal law is asking uh, the, its subject, who are you? Are you an enemy? To what extent are you? How dangerous are you? Right? Uh, and so the main point or the main critique was that citizen criminal law doesn't really exist is because, well, one way in which I can try and construct this argument is by trying to take seriously this idea, what would the citizen criminal law look like? Right? And uh, in this paper, I interact with the work of this, this philosopher called Anthony Duff, uh, which I think is one of the most sophisticated accounts of, of what's involved in this ideal of, of citizen criminal law. And for him, citizen criminal law would need to be a, a communicative process. So the, at the core of the idea of citizenship, of respect for the subject of criminal law, is this notion of communication. So the criminal law should communicate, should dialogue. And, with its subject. And in need to do so, it needs to be a reciprocal engagement. Right? Uh, and at the core of this idea of reciprocity is the notion of recognition. So the criminal law can be communicative as long as it recognizes its subject as a rational agent, as a citizen, as a member of the community with whom we want to communicate. But obviously, in his own theory, he himself admits that his idea of communication, although he really wants to contrast it with what he calls a problematic idea of expression, that this notion that criminal law expresses something, expresses a moral <coughs> message, 
symbolism, etc. And he says, no, expression is too one-sided. We need to seek to uh, promote communication. But then, as the deeper we get into his description, the more we notice that this idea of communication doesn't really live up to the expectations that he creates when he talks about recognition, reciprocity, etc. Because it already, this communication with the subject already starts from a very specific judgment that this uh, person is being accused of doing something wrong. Right? The, so the crime, there's no discussion, no negotiation as to the nature of the crime. The, there's no, no opening for the criminal, for the defendant, to try and explain what he did or she did, what uh, uh, he she did. Uh, it's only an idea. The, the communication there is a very limited, uh, 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 has a very limited space of trying to explain him or herself, oh, I was defending myself, or I was acting under duress, or I didn't really intend to do what I was doing, but this is really shallow. Right? That's why Duff himself uh, concedes that what, what's happening in the criminal trial, in the criminal process, is at best forceful moral communication. And I'm like, well, forceful moral, but that, that really isn't communication. Right? That's, that, there's no reciprocity there. Right? Uh, the, we are not really talking about uh, people talk, dialoguing on equal footing. And in order to try and go to the, the, the core of what's wrong or problematic with this idea of communication, I rely on this notion of recognition. And then that's why I go back to Hegel. Uh, because Hegel provides what I think is the most interesting account of record. Not only Hegel, but people who talk about Hegel. And one very interesting discussion of Hegel's work in this area is offered by Alexander Kozhev. Uh, uh, who manages to, to really expose and bring out the, the more critical Marxist aspects of, especially young Hegel. Uh, so anyway, I won't go into detail into this idea, but, but recognition for Hegel is at the core of, of, of human being, is our most, our deepest desire is our desire to be recognized. Right? However, recognition is necessarily intersubjective. It is necessarily uh, dependence on others. So you can only really be recognized by someone who you fully recognize. Right? So you cannot be recognized without recognizing. So there is this, this deep aspect in recognition. It, recognition is necessarily mutual recognition. Right? And that's precisely what's not happening in criminal law. Right? So how, the, how is it that liberal theorists manage to talk about this idea of, of recognition, equality, autonomy, and criminal law? Well, there are, uh, if you look at Hegel's work especially and, 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 and try to, to use it as an interesting way of thinking about uh, law in itself, I guess we can say that there are three <coughs> ways in which recognition can be uh, seen to exist in this process, uh, in this framework. One is an as, as an assumption. I think that's the main uh, 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 place of recognition in liberal theory, especially. We assume we're all equal. We assume our, our, our community, uh, our communities already provide us with everything we need for mutual recognition. So we're citizens, so therefore a crime is the only thing, or the main thing that disrupts what would otherwise be a very uh, completely fulfilling environment where we can all uh, recognize each other as full members of the community. And that's obviously a fantasy. Uh, Hegel himself in his later work, even though he really tries to assume, he says the modern state, the basis of the modern state is basically a state in which there is mutual recognition as an objective reality, but he himself in his philosophy of right cannot help but hint in several points that this is actually it's an assumption, it's a fantasy, it's an illusion that we need to maintain for the modern state to, to, to exist. Because it says, for instance, the, mer the very existence of poverty denies this mutual recognition. Uh, justice, especially in the international sphere, cannot help but uh, become uh, victor's justice. So there are all these, these different elements in, in our current society that kind of hint at us that this assumption is, is an assumption. Uh, the other point, which is where uh, I guess 
many liberal theorists that try, like Duff, I, I imagine, uh, uh, who tries to, to be a bit more, uh, I'd say, sensitive to the context or to the, to, to, to the social reality of crime and punishment, I guess posit recognition as an aspiration. So the criminal law acts as if like, we, we need to reach out to recognition and we need to create a criminal law that tries to foster recognition. And I guess when it's Peter Ramsey, when he talks about the presumption of innocence, he says that, well, the presumption of innocence, what it actually does is that it imposes a burden of trust on people. So he says, basically, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, enacting the presumption of innocence, we act as if we can trust the criminal. And obviously, this is in itself entirely problematic as well, especially if we want to really try to put that in practice. So if we act as if we trust, we are already assuming we don't really trust that person. We can't really trust. That's not really mutual recognition either. The, thickest, uh, the thicker account, part of Hegel's uh, 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 account of recognition, is that recognition is a process. Right? It is an un ongoing, ongoing process uh, in social reality. Right? He said it's a struggle. It's actually a, a, Axel Honneth and, and Kojev talk about it very clearly. There is a struggle for recognition in society. Right? And interestingly, the, the main conclusion that we take from, especially Kojev's account, Hegel's account as well, is that recognition is a process that most of the time, or especially throughout history and in, in social settings, a process that goes wrong. Right? So we, in our struggle for recognition, we arrive at situations of unequal, broken recognition, what he calls the master-slave relation, right? the master-slave dialectic. Right? So we arrive at a situation in which one person basically concedes the struggle, one part concedes the struggle, and, and becomes a slave, a bondsman, to the other person who wins the struggle and becomes the master. And Hegel says, well, but that's that's not really good. This is not recognition. It's not satisfying. And interestingly, the first thing that comes in our head is that, well, obviously it's not satisfying because one of the parties is not really recognized. But the, 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 the main, the, the, for me, the full thrust of Hegel's argument is that none of the parties is recognized. What the master receives is, is not. It's an illusion. It's an illusion of power. It's not really recognition because it doesn't fully recognize the other party. So he's never fully recognized in return. Right. But uh, uh, is, a, is a deeply problematic form of, of recognition because, as like I say, it, it concedes or, or, uh, rela social relation because it concedes power, the power to dictate the, the, uh, the social setting, the social relation between the two parties. At the same time, so it's there is, I guess, this strong motivation for the master to preserve this relation, believing that this relation there is advantages to, to the master, but that nevertheless is never fully satisfying and never really reaches any of the, the true ideals that, that we seek in our human condition. Uh, that's why Kojev especially would talk that, well, the slave is the one that actually has the potential to overcome his or her condition and to, to the, so we, there's no hope in ever expecting the master to, to try and, and reach full recognition. We need to expect the slave to realize. And there's a, a really fascinating discussion of that, but I won't go into that. Right. So, so what we can really see it happening in criminal law and punishment is exactly this situation of broken recognition. Right. The, the punisher, the, the criminal justice system, is, acts as the master who, who um, who dictates the terms of communication, believes that they, they are setting a, a standard of justice, but in fact, all that they're doing is perpetuating uh, uh, a situation of broken recognition, see, perpetuating the struggle, basically. Uh, and it's self-defeating in itself. Right? Uh, so, well, I guess there's terrorism in the title of my paper, I haven't talked about it yet, but so why, why why is terrorism interesting to this discussion? Well, basically, if we go back to accounts of communication such as Duff's, for instance, the terrorist has a very interesting place there. Because uh, when Duff says, well, the criminal justice process has to be a 
criminal law has to be a communicative endeavor where we treat each other as members of a community, etc. He then goes on to consider, well, whether or not his, this idea of community has limits. So do, does it mean that we have a duty to treat everyone as a member of that community? And he says, well, there are certain situations that can put this idea of community to the limit. And the main one is the idea of the terrorist. Because it says, well, the terrorist, really, uh, uh, the very idea of terrorism is that they're not trying to communicate with us. They're trying to destroy everything that our community represents. represents. So uh, uh, the terrorist can really put this, this idea of uh, this dialogic logic, uh, this communicative logic to the test. And interesting, uh, interestingly, he considers whether or not the criminal law should treat the terrorist as a citizen, as a criminal, which for him is a member of the community, or if we should treat the terrorist as something else, as an enemy, for instance. Uh, and I, in my paper, I analyzed two articles by Anthony Duff, which are three years apart. And interestingly, in the first one, he's very reluctant. He said, no, no, we can't really do this. We, we have to really uh, uphold our principles. And, and uh, 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 this idea of, of, of putting anybody, even a terrorist, in this uh, different uh, relation is deeply problematic. But then three years later, he arrives at a really different conclusion. He adds a third, uh, so to speak, a third possibility there, which is to treat the terrorist as an unlawful combatant, as in the US, which is basically not even an enemy. It's just a person who has no rights and can be just thrown in Guantanamo uh, uh, and forgotten about. And then he says, well, that's really wrong. But an enemy, an enemy combatant is, they have rights. They have rights under international law. So maybe, uh, 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 there is, uh, uh, he's more reluctant to accept that the terrorist, in other words, can be regarded as a citizen, right? But in my, what, what I try to say about this is that uh, if I'm, if my, my intuition is correct that actually every criminal law is in essence already an, a, 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 treating its subject as an enemy, or at least as a potential enemy, terrorism doesn't represent the limits of uh, uh, this communicative idea of, of in criminal law. Actually, what terrorism really does is expose everything that's problematic with criminal law in the first place. It fully exposes the underlying logic of every process of criminalization. It just throws out in the open. Right? It throws, out, throws it out in the open, that the idea that the, the, the notion of community upheld by criminal law is severely limited is severely unequal, exclusionary, and deeply problematic. Right. So, if we really want to be communicative with, uh, 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 in our relations with others, we need to seek a very different uh, approach to problems such as crime and terrorism. And this maybe includes or involves even rethinking our own ideas of, of what crime really is, of what terrorism really is. And uh, uh, I won't go into detail now. How much time do we have? Uh, two more minutes. Two more minutes, okay. Yeah, so I won't go, so uh, what I'm trying to develop now, now that I've got back to it, is that, well, uh, last year, two years ago, we had a really interesting panel in Critical Realism and Conference about law uh, that uh, Alan organized. And in that, I, I started thinking about love, or rather loving, from the, the work, uh, through the work of Eric Fromm. And he talks, he makes a fantastic critique of, of love, uh, as in the Western way of thinking about love as deeply problematic. Uh, and he tries to uh, come up with a, a, a fuller account of love, which he says that, uh, which he conceives, in which he conceives love as an action which uh, he doesn't actually talk about it, but I got a very interesting comment in, uh, in, the, at, in my presentation at the conference saying he's, he contrasts, in essence, love with loving. So love should never be an object. Love is an activity. And for me, I start more and more to realize that this thicker notion of loving is at the core of what a proper process of, of perhaps a, 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 an inclusionary process of recognition uh, should be about. Right? And uh, uh, 
his account of lobbying has very interesting, it is fantastically rich and has very interesting uh, 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 details, and I'm happy to talk about that afterwards, but I think I perhaps should just stop here. Well, I just wanted to <coughs> say first of all,